Hey everyone, it's your spooky fave Zero back on the Big Girl Belt with my favorite media hero, Gotham Geek Girl. And we got a couple words for you today about that new flick, A Haunting in Venice. You can catch A Haunting in Venice in theaters only starting September 9th, featuring the legendary Hercule Poirot, played by uh, director Kenneth Branagh. Uh, yeah, so Kenneth is actually returning uh, in the third movie of the series. I didn't know this at first uh, when we went to go see it, um, that A Haunting in Venice is actually the third one when he returns as Piro and he actually writes and directs, I'm sorry, directs and stars in the movie. And he's living in exile and now he must solve a murder um, after attending a seance. So this movie was pretty surprising. Um, like you mentioned, it's coming out on September 15th. Um, and it's it's really surprising. I without giving too much away, because we're going to keep the spoiler free, it does have a very exciting twist to it. Um, and if you want to get into a little bit about the cast. So we have our protagonist. He's living in exile. He's done with the whole murder mystery shebang. He's trying to live out his days peacefully. Um, but one good, one good mystery is the thing that brings him back after an old friend comes back into his life, talking all this mumbo jumbo about a seance. And this man, if you've seen the previous movies um, or read the source material that it comes from, is a man of fact. So this is your typical whodunit. Let me get all of my alibis from all of my characters. Let's lay it down on the table so we can come to a conclusion. So naturally... Any sort of supernatural third party is just thrown straight out the window until the day that he finds he might actually have to consider it, which is what makes this whodunit a little bit different um, for the the classic um, themes and and schedules, <laughs> you know, very tight schedules for classic whodunits. Um, but this is what got Nadia and I really interested. It's like this third party that doesn't usually take place within the straight up mystery genre. Um, yeah, like I guess uh, piggybacking off that a little bit with uh, the whodunit genre, it's kind of become a little bit like repetitive where you go into the movie already figuring out who did it before the movie even started. So with this one, it was a very different twist with like ghosts involved and spirits. And I really, really enjoyed it that they kind of put like a spin on it with like the horror elements. And it's actually um, following, uh, what was it? Murder on the Orient Express and Death on the Nile. Uh, I actually haven't seen Death on the Nile. So I'm gonna go back and watch it now after watching this film. But I thought that was pretty exciting how this is like very different. This has a lot more horror elements and even though it kind of takes this character into different realms, that kind of was part of the intrigue and mystery of this is like, is it real? Is it not? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely recommend this film both to the murder mystery crowd, but also to horror fans. Um, I personally am not really a murder mystery girl. I've been a little bit more... Um, on the fence about him since we got uh, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies not too long ago. So I guess I can, you know, put a foot in. But I would recommend this film because it's a nice, like, in-between, if you know what I mean. Uh, the paranormal aspect was enough to get me through the door. Um, but, you know, once I did get through the door, I was pleasantly surprised. And I do think it's also a really cool alternative for your classic murder mystery um, investigative, that kind of fandom people to, you know, take a chance because although we don't stray entirely into the unknown and the fantastical with this movie, it's just enough um, to stay in the realm of realism, but also just enough to send us into, I was about to say the afterlife, but that's, <laughs> that's too, too legit, but to send us into a little bit of the unknown. Um, and I too had no idea that this was part of a series when I decided to attend the screening with Nadia. Um, but I think it's a nice touch. And I do think um, it's cool to see, um, and because I will be going back to watch uh, the first two, it's, it's cool to see a character who is so like strongly connected to fact and to detail have to consider what about the supernatural, you know? I absolutely love that because there were so many parts in the movie where I was like, there's no way he's going to explain this. There's no way to explain this. And he's like, nope, this, this, and this. I spotted this. I realized this, this person's reaction, uh, this thing in the corner moved. Like he was just very on point that you can tell like, He's very skilled at his job, but I love that with the movie where, like you said, like he he even had to question himself, like, 
uh, am I going crazy? Did, did this happen? Did this not? And the movie did a really good job of kind of like leaving things up to interpretation, but also like mm -hmm. creeping you out. <laughs> like right. I kind of described it as like, um, I said it was like uh, in my reaction that it was like spine tingling and like very suspenseful, but it also had like these horror elements. And then I described it as like Knives Out meets the orphanage because <laughs> it kind of takes aspects from both. And like, I don't know, it was really like exciting and shocking, but there were still a lot of like points where like everyone's panicking and freaking out and they're all like suspecting each other, which is just, like typical for whodunits. But with this, it's like, uh, that was a ghost. Like we were all in this room. What just happened? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we should we should all witness this. We should all yeah. be on the same page right now. Um, but I, you know, I like the play of skepticism um, to put this film in like the subgenre, you know, because it's murder, mystery, investigative horror at the end. Um, I do think it lacks at times not enough to you know have me sitting here today and telling you not to watch it i actually do really recommend it um but if you're just a straight up horror fan who doesn't really dabble in investigative mystery stuff or like whodunits you might be a little bit turned off by some of the jump scares seem to maybe um not perform all the way um i'm not mad at it it's just something that i noticed but something that i can really applaud from coming from the world of horror into this mystery genre is um, the the use of sound. And Najir and I talk about sound a lot when we cover horror movies. Um, well, I guess my point is the lack of sound because there's a lot of high uh, high stakes and very um, like high pressure moments in this movie when you know everyone's kind of at a standstill and everybody's pointing at each other and throwing blame and, and things like that. Um, but the use of silence actually brings a lot of attention to what, you know, what he, might he be thinking? What might anybody be thinking? Um, and I like that. And I think that's pretty unique when it comes to horror with when it's not followed by a jump scare. Usually like that's the that's the thing that's going to let you know, OK, it's too quiet. Something's about to happen. But in this case the silence kind of represents maybe even like a, a fourth party, which is just really heavy suspense in the air. Um, and that was refreshing just usually because whenever I hear nothingness, I know what's about to happen after. Um, but with A Haunting in Venice, I hear nothingness and I think to myself, what's going to be the next move? What are people thinking? Um, yeah, I mean, unconventional for me, but... I was a fan. Um, I guess let me get your take on this because, you know, Tina Fey comes from like a very like comedic background. So uh, her addition to the cast, um, I kind of um, enjoy like the banter she had um, with uh, her Hercule. <laughs> um, but I don't know. How did you feel about like the comedy aspect? I guess like was it like just enough like where it didn't distract too much from the movie? Because that was kind of how I felt. But do you think that was kind of like a plus for the horror not being as scary? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think usually I would say yes. Um, but in this case, I'm going to say no. That's a really good question, by the way. Because, um, you know, horror and comedy are like this. They are a married couple and they go together very, very well. Um, I wanted to laugh more, um, but I was scared that I was going to miss stuff. Because this man, Hercule Perot, he is da 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 da. Everything moves very quickly in this film, so I was kind of worried about missing anything. So I don't want to like stay landed on the jokes too much. Um, I don't think that this would be a enough comedy to save me from something. But I also don't think that. Well, maybe I just have a ridiculously thick skin. That could be just me. <laughs> but I don't think that the scares in this film really are put there to scare you. I think that the horror elements and, you know, the paranormal and the unknown are put there to add even more confusion. Um, because it's something that they're just, when it comes to the paranormal, there literally are no facts. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if this was meant to be like scary as much as it was creepy, which is the same thing I was saying about the silence added to the creepiness of it. 
Um, but more than anything, I really enjoyed Tina Fey's like and and um forgive me, I'm forgetting the name of her character, but our uh, two leads. It was Ar Ariadne uh, sorry, Ariadne Oliver. She was like the a crime novelist, basically, and she was friends with Perot and they accompany each other. Yeah, sorry, accompany each other to this house, which is supposedly haunted, and she's basically writing a book, and that's kind of how it all starts. Right. I think more than anything, I, I appreciate her being kind of like the, not a voice of reason, but like the a voice of a paranormal or like voice of a, a believer um, that's going to be continuously in her ear, in, in his ear, sorry, um, and also cracking the little jokes at it, kind of like, you know, lighten up. Imagine the... The, the possibilities outside of what's in your notebook right now. Um, yeah, that was a good question. I like that one. What do you think about the rest of the characters? Because we have like a really solid band here. Oh, yes. Uh, Michelle Yo, I'm trying to remember what her name was. <sighs> here. Joyce Reynolds. Okay. She had, it's go. funny, she had the most American name. She was yeah. American, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think she, <laughs> so she, um, was i believe in the original uh, agatha christie novel she attends the party and she's kind of like doing a seance and um i don't want to give away spoilers um but she kind of plays a very uh instrumental role in the movie and i don't know i thought it was fun to see her in this kind of role where it was like you kind of believe her like you're like is is she is this like is she like scamming people or is she like really truly believe that she's like reaching the dead and like talking to them and i think she um did like a really good job of kind of like i don't know like making people question her but be like she might be real like she was mm -hmm. very good at like presenting herself and like her knowledge and even her team like without spoiling like even having her team along with her everyone kind of thought like oh shit like this woman's a real deal right like she's good but she's almost too good you know what i mean that michelle yo man that that was the name. That was another thing that got me into the theater. Was I watch her in anything? <laughs> oh my god! Anything, anything, everything, all at once, yeah. all the time. Me and my girl Michelle Yo. I'm rooting for her. Um, and as for the rest of the cast, like I think we had some great casting. Sometimes I get a little bit worried when I see a bunch of white people on the poster. Just to be completely honest with you, because um, I'm thinking, you know, we're either going the tropey route or I'm gonna have you know, two hours of me sitting in this chair trying to figure out who's who because everybody's very similar. Um, but albeit Michelle Yeoh is the only person of color in the main cast, this is such a good whodunit. Everyone has a very strong personality that, you know, is, you, you just can't. You have to separate them from each other. Everyone is equal parts trustworthy and suspicious, which I think is is a hard thing to do because from the audience, I feel like we all are gonna pick favorites. Um, and so to have you as a viewer be equally skeptical of everyone and feel equally, you know, uh, trustworthy from everyone is a really hard thing to do, especially with a cast that is predominantly, you know, the same background of people. Um, it, it could be a difficult thing from writing standpoint, but, I was really stumped. I was really stumped. And usually, you know, coming from the, you know, our background of like being nerds, like we just like to speculate, right? Like we see the trailer and we're like, ba 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 ba. I gotta figure it out. Good on me, whatever. <laughs> but I'm really sitting there, like I have, I have no idea. It could be everyone. It could be anyone, or it could be no one, and it could be a ghost. I really, yeah. And I, I, I don't think <laughs> if if you say otherwise. If you're going to go to the theater and watch A Haunting in Venice, and then you're going to come back to Bugo Bell and told us that you had it figured out the whole time, you're lying. Yeah. You're lying. I was going to say, like, uh, I love Knives Out. I'm not a huge fan of Glass Onion, because Glass Onion, I figured out in two minutes. I was like, Ed Edward Norton. Got to the end of the movie, I was like, it was completely predictable, because you already know what to look for. And I kind of feel like the genre is getting played out. But with this movie, it did such a great job, like, like I said, like you think it's ghosts or it could be humans. And I don't know, it it wasn't tropey. I guess like I want to get your opinion on that too and like the horror aspect. 
I don't think it was like very tropey in a sense of like a classic who done it. Like I I don't know, I think they did a better job of kind of making you like suspicious of everyone and then the whole like supernatural elements. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, <laughs> a lot of this comes from the fans and we kind of I will admit it, we think we know everything sometimes, <laughs> which is obviously not the case. Um, but when the the creators of whatever content understand how the fans will consume something um and you know if your audience is people who love investigative stuff and mystery or horror which you know definitely kind of bleed the same in the sense that the nerds are gonna start thinking about it before you even lay down the framework um i think that uh it's become even harder and harder and a good example of like how uh creators and studios have like adapted to this are movies like malignant or movies like barbarian or that new one cobweb where we have to think about as movie creators what the audience is thinking at any given moment when they're consuming this and i think that's what makes for a really good horror but also a, a murder mystery or any type of mystery you got to think about what the audience is thinking before they can even get to it um and i think that's what we got here and a lot of it was um actually nadia you had me think of this but editing really smart editing um that you know will purposefully leave things out um and that's a, an issue that i did have with glass onion is i think that they tried to do like the editing thing um but when you go back and watch it as the viewer you're like something was left out in that moment but the editing was so smart and haunting in venice um we weren't really given the this you know a chance to be like something's not right here um i'm just sitting here in my movie theater suite speculating the whole time until we finally get a conclusive answer uh which makes sense thank god <laughs> yeah they kind of didn't leave like like I was saying, like with um, a glass onion, like they didn't really leave like any like breadcrumbs. Like they didn't push you too hard to question. Cause then like I was saying, like it, it gets a little tropey if they push you too hard towards like a certain character, because then you're like, oh, it's it's definitely not them because mm -hmm. they're going too hard. So right. I, I go into the movie already with that in my mind, like not, not necessarily not saying that I'm not enjoying it, but I'm more so like, like, I don't know. I'm like figuring it out. With this, I think it was a little more like, like I said, like they didn't push you towards any one single character. You kind of just, I guess, uh, were there like for the whole bigger picture, like with everything going on at once. There was never a time where you're like, oh, it's that person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. um, another suspect uh, was uh, Jamie Dornan's character. Uh, he was the doctor, Dr. Leslie Ferrier. And um, supposedly he's another big change from the book. Uh, supposedly in the book, he was a lawyer that died before the story even happens. So mm, okay. I'm curious to see um, for fans, uh, like how they're gonna, I guess, go in, go into uh, seeing his character and like his interpretation and how yeah, did you feel totally. about him? If we have any Agatha Christie fans uh, watching, please let us know your thoughts after you return from the theater because I would love to know. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back and read them now. <laughs> oh, I'm certain. I'm gonna start with the movies. I yeah. don't know if I got all that time, but <laughs> I, after watching A Haunting in Venice, I honestly fell in love with this main character. He's so, you know, unironically funny mm -hmm. and a little bit zany. Um, it kind of reminds you of a weird family member that you might have that thinks about things extremely critically um, in, in a fun and different <laughs> way. But um, similar to Knives Out, having a strong protagonist could definitely bring people back, which is exactly what happened. Hercule Perot, that's my boy. We like this now. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's so crazy that he um like directed the movie too. So I and all I, all three of them at that. Yeah, I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> it's cool. I mean, it kind of tells me that like we have a little bit of an emotional connection mm -hmm. um, to the character until in into uh, this whole roller coaster of murder mystery who done it, which you know I really like. I'm down for it. I'm down for it. And you know what? If they happen to make another one in the future. I'll be back. But for now, I have some homework to do with the past two. 
Yeah, same. So I, I overall for me, I think they did a good job, um, like successfully uh, telling this like story, uh, getting to know the characters, like all of the characters. We kind of get like a little glimpse into like their backstories and like their motivations, and uh, I guess kind of how they all come back together in the situation. Like, of course, without giving spoilers, how they all reconnect. Um, and then I don't know. Like, I think the cast did a great job. I think the writing was great. Um, they did a great job uh, showcasing, like, like I said, like the horror elements, the comedy. I think it was just enough um, where it didn't like overwhelm or become a comedy because then we would look at the movie differently if it was mm -hmm. like, um, I guess, marketed as a comedy and it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so I think on that aspect, they did a really good job of handling every kind of genre, I guess, that was incorporated into the movie. Mm -hmm. My only, only thing is I think they could have pushed the horror up a little, little bit, but that's that's just maybe me wanting to see more. Yeah. Um, it's like I think a that might just be us. Yeah, I was like, I wanted a little more ghost, a little more of this, a right. little more like ah moments. But if you look at it from the standpoint where it is like a classic mystery, they nailed it. Absolutely. Yeah, we get just enough, you know, creepy, like lingering feelings of dread, a little bit of uncertainty that we know so well from horror. But I'm with Nadia, and that might be just because we're two creepy chicks. <laughs> but I could have, you know, maybe two or three dials up on like a the little scares. Blood, a little gore, just, a little uh, scare. Just a little. I would have loved a little, a little bit more blood. We maybe got a drop or two in there. <laughs> um, but you know, it, I mean, it's it's successfully bridging genres. Exactly. Um, I would have liked a little bit more, but that's just the territory that Nadia and I come from. But yeah, regardless, I would definitely re recommend seeing this in theater when it pops out. If you can't make it out to the theater, this is a really, really good rainy day watch with a cup of tea and some fuzzy socks yeah go see it <laughs> go see it yes go see a haunting in see venice um directed by september hold on pause najir for editing yep. release date 15 yeah okay all right. Oh, there was one more thing I forgot to point out. Yeah, go say it. Um, so in the movie, it takes place in post World War Two. Um, that was kind of one thing. Do you think they did a good job of showcasing? Like this was in Italy. It was after World War Two. Do you think they um seem too modern, or do you think they got a, a good job of kind of making it like a period piece? Well, to be honest with you, I'm not that much of a history buff. But when I do hear like modern American accents, it puts me, you know, it kind of takes me out. And I know with a lot of period pieces that I've seen, we have a very distinct um, like old American accent that we hear that kind of, you know, if the costumes and the set design isn't enough to let us know what time this is in, you know, this funky accent will do that whether or not you know i don't know how accurate this old american english accent is but regardless for a period piece it lets the rest of the dumb americans in the audience who were not there around <laughs> <laughs> post world war ii <laughs> like myself um that this doesn't take place in present day so i will say that a couple of the american accents kind of pulled me out of it a little um but once we got deeper into the film and i started getting some context from the different characters because they're from different places mm -hmm. and they have their own different backgrounds i was able to put two and two together um but then again i'm not the hugest period piece girl and maybe it was accurate for the time i've never even been to italy i don't even know <laughs> yeah because we had uh american we had italian was there? Fr I think he's French, right? Mm -hmm. A German, mm -hmm. Hungarian, Hungarian. Yeah, there was mm -hmm. like a lot going on. Several, yeah. All right, now let me just do the closeout. Um, Najir, just stick that last point somewhere where it makes sense. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably in the beginning. Okay. Oh, this is September nine. Really? Yeah. Or is that when we're allowed to? Because it says release date September fifteenth on my um. 
Oh, nah. Now here it says 15. Oh, that's not good. It's got 9 and 15 online. Maybe they moved the date or something. Anyway, regardless, I'm going to take us out. So that's our review. I think it's a pretty good one. I would recommend that you see A Haunting in Venice in theaters, and I'm sure Nadia as well. Check it out starting September 15th in theaters only. And again, if you can't make it to the theaters, this makes a perfect rainy day watch. Just make sure that you have your fuzzy socks on you.